Ayat for reading surah Tuha. Alhamdulillah. Hope you arrived all safely. Inshallah, we'll be starting off now. Inshallah, we have first of all a talk by Brother Mufisad Tausir, and he shall be talking on. The importance of Quran and Sunnah, inshallah. Um, but before we proceed, up to make some announcements uh, for procedure. Um, the fire exits are located for the sisters uh, at the back entrance there, and the brothers is just on the left. Um, toilets are fully segregated, so uh, you can easily make your way to them as you as you please. Um, we shall have a salah break at 6 p.m. inshallah for 15 minutes. We shall resume with a talk by um, Mufti, Sajjad. Mufti Sajjad, who shall be arriving shortly, inshallah, which will be followed by hopefully a live video conference from London by Dr. Kamarul Hassan. And then we'll be finishing that off with a talk by um, Mufti Javed Iqbal. Please have your questions ready. Uh, there'll be papers going around um, because there'll be a question and answer session right at the end. So you can have your, all your answers then, inshallah. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina man yahdillahu falamudillala wa man yudlilhu falahadiyala wa nashadu anna sayyidina wa nabiyina wa maulana muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh wa sallallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran kathira amma ba'd fa'udhu billahi minash shaytan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim the topic which i'm going to look at is a very very important topic it is important because it is mentioned in a hadith which can be found in the Muatta of Imam Malik Rahimullah and in the Mustadrak of Imam Hakim Rahimullah that the Prophet of Allah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that I have left behind two things and if my Ummah remain steadfast on these two things if my ummah hold on to these two things they shall never ever go astray and the two things which rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned was number one kitabullah the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and number two was sunnati and my sunnah and my blessed ways so therefore the topic which i'm going to look at and discuss today is regarding the importance of the Holy Quran and the importance of the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and more importantly how we can implement the words of Allah the orders of Allah the commands of Allah and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam into our lives now Muslims worldwide believe and it is also the belief of the Ahle Sunnah wal Jama'ah that the words of the Holy Quran is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's spoken words. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kalam. But the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conversed these words to Sayyiduna Jibra'il alayhi salam who in turn then passed it on to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam it is not the same way you and I speak it's not the same way you and I converse with each other and it's not the same way you and I talk with each other because Allah says laysa kamithlihi shay there is no one like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but in principle we believe that from Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen 
all the way until minal jinnati wan nas every single word every single harf every single letter is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's direct speech and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words and kalam and because it is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words speech and kalam we can find many many examples in history in the books of sira where many many people who have heard the words of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who have heard the beauty of the holy quran and the eloquence of the holy quran the beauty the structure of the holy quran it had a effect on them and also it had an effect on their hearts they gave up all their old ways their evil ways their wrong ways and they converted to islam take an example or look at sayyidina umar bin khattab radiallahu as mentioned in the hadith of sahih al-bukhari sahih muslim that umar radiallahu he would say this himself that he had so much hatred for rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had so much hatred for islam he had so much hatred for muslims and the sahabas and the companions and one day umar radiallahu was in the gathering of abu jahal when abu jahal said that whoever naudhu billah can kill rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam i will give him 100 camels so after the gathering umar radiallahu he approaches abu jahal and he says that abu jahal you know are you really serious here or is it one of those empty promises you're making that if i kill rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam you are going to give me 100 camels so abu jahal turned around and he said no i am dead serious If you can naudhu billah bring me the head of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam I will guarantee you 100 camels. So then what happened Umar radiyallahu anhu he then makes his way to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam naudhu billah to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in turn finish and terminate Islam. On the way he meets Nuaym bin Abdullah. And Nuaym bin Abdullah asked Umar radiyallahu anhu that where are you going? So Nuaym so Umar radiyallahu replies by saying that I'm going to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's house to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and terminate and finish Islam. So Nuaym bin Abdullah replies to Umar radiyallahu and he says that I think you should firstly sort out your household. And what Nuaym bin Abdullah was implying he was implying that his sister Fatima bint Khattab radiyallahu anha had converted to Islam. So instead of trying to terminate and finish off Islam from someone else, firstly try to finish off and terminate Islam from your own household. And from this another subtle point which we can gather from this particular story is that remember reformation, rectification or islah starts from yourself and thereafter from your household and this is not a cultural thing which i'm telling it's actually a quranic injunction allah says ya ayyuhal ladina amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara that save yourself thereafter words wa ahlikum and your family from the fire of hell and again as i said that this was the one of the qualities of all the messengers and all the anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam that whenever they received prophet from allah they firstly worked on their families and i said that this is a quality of all the prophets but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this in the holy quran in connection with sayyiduna ismail alayhi salam where allah says wad qul fil kitab ismail innahu kana sadiqal wa'di wa kana rasulan nabiyya وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَحْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ That one of the qualities, as I said, is of all prophets, but Allah has mentioned it in connection with Ismail alayhi salam. But one of the connect, uh, qualities of Ismail alayhi salam, after receiving prophethood, after receiving nubuwwat, وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَحْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ He would firstly order his family members, بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ to establish salah and to give zakah. So from this we can understand that islah rectification reformation it starts from yourself then it starts from your family sometimes we see many brothers mashallah they've got a beard they seem very practicing but unfortunately when we look at their sons when we look at their daughters when we look at their wife 
totally away from the deen and totally away from the religion. So when Nu'aym bin Abdullah told Umar al-Anhu that, look, you want to finish off Islam, try finishing off Islam from your own household. Your sister Fatima has converted to Islam. Go and speak to her. Try to terminate Islam from her. So now Umar al-Anhu realized that this is true. Trying to stop other people from practicing the deen, I should firstly stop my sister from practicing the religion. So he then makes his way to his sister's house. As all of you know the story on the way, uh, when he goes to his sister's house, there's this kind of scruffle between uh, Hazrat Umar al who's brother-in-law, which led to him lashing out and hitting his sister Fatima bint Khattab anha causing her to bleed. Now Umar al anhu when he saw that his sister got hit and on top of that she was bleeding, he felt really, really embarrassed, really, really ashamed. And the reason why Umar al anhu was embarrassed and was ashamed because Umar al anhu he was a man of steel. He, was, he had so much fear. The believers at that time, even the non-believers, they were scared of Umar al anhu as mentioned in the hadith, even shaitan was scared of Umar radil anhu. So everyone was scared of Umar radil anhu. Now when Umar radil anhu hit his sister, now someone fierce, big, strong as Umar radil anhu is considered to be an act of cowardice to hit a woman. So when he hit his sister, he felt really, really ashamed, really, really embarrassed. He then asked his sister that, can I have a look at the words which you were reading? Then according to two narrations, one narration goes on to say that his sister Fatima said to Umar al Anhu that go and perform a ghusl. In another narration, it says go and perform wudu. And after performing the wudu or ghusl, Umar al Anhu then started reading Surah Tawha. Tawha ma anzalna alayka al Quran al Tashqa. And when he reached one and a half pages later, when he reached the verse, Inna ni an Allah la ilaha illa ana fa'budi. This is actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to Musa alayhi salam that I am Allah, there is no God besides me, fa'budni, worship me, wa aqimi salat and dhikri and establish salah for my remembrance. So when Hazrat Umar al Anhu reached this verse, and as I said, Umar al Anhu, so fierce, nothing scared him, nothing kind of overwhelmed him. Even Shaitan was scared of Umar al Anhu, but when Hazrat Umar al Anhu reached this verse, he was overwhelmed by the beauty of the Holy Quran. He was overwhelmed by the eloquence of the Holy Quran. He could not contain himself. He started crying. He started weeping. Tears rolled down his eyes and he saturated and wetted his beard. And he then accepted Islam. He then realized that this is the words of the whole. This, these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It cannot be the words of any human being. It cannot be the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As they were saying. And it can never ever be the words of a magician. It has to be the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He acknowledged it. He accepted Islam because of that. Look at Hazrat Umar al Look how strong he was. Remember only a few hours ago he had the intention to kill Rasulullah so you could imagine how far he must have been from the deen but then when he just read one and a half pages of the Holy Quran changed his entire life transformed him to what Rasulullah mentioned in another hadith of Sunan Tirmizi that if there was to be a prophet after me lakana Umar bin Khattab anhu, it would have been Sayyiduna Umar anhu. now Umar anhu's story it's not the only story. It's not an isolated case. Another example which we can see from the books of Sirah is of the emperor of Ethiopia, Najashi. Now again, when the situations, the persecutions in Makkah reached an all-time high, Rasulullah allowed a group of sahabas and companions to leave Makkah and to go to Ethiopia. Now, when the Sahabas and the Muslims, they went to Ethiopia, the Quraysh, the pagans of Makkah, they found out. So they sent two people, Abdullah bin Rabi'ah and Amr bin As, to go to Ethiopia, to speak to the emperor of Ethiopia and basically try to persuade him to hand over the Sahabas and the Muslims to them so that they can take them back to Makkah and continue with their persecution. 
Now they went to Ethiopia. They went to the emperor of Ethiopia, Najashi's court. And they said to him that these Muslims, these companions who have come, they're fugitives. They're rebels. They've gone against our ancestors' religion, against our forefathers' religion. And they have now come to your country, your place, and they are now preaching a religion which is not the one you preach and practice in your country. What I'm trying to imply is that in Ethiopia, Christianity was the main religion. So these two people, they come and they're trying to like steer it here. And they're saying, well, they are, they're not following their forefathers' religion. They've come to your country, but they're not following your religion. They're following a total different religion. So then the emperor of Ethiopia, he then called the Sahabas and the companions to his court. He then asked the Sahabas that, what do you believe in? Your prophet, your messenger, what is he preaching? What is he telling you? So as you know from the books of Hadith and the books of Sirah, Abdullah bin Ja'far anhu, the cousin brother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he then stands up in front of uh, Najashi, the emperor of Ethiopia, and gives what we call an inspirational speech. And he says to the emperor of Ethiopia that before prophethood, before bi'athad, before nubuwat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we were in total darkness. Usurping the wealth of the poor and needy was considered to be the norm. Disobeying our parents was considered to be the norm. Ascribing partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was considered to be okay and acceptable. And worst of all, we were involved in the most horrendous of acts, such as burying our own daughters alive. But then when Rasulullah came, he told us that, no, you need to be kind to your parents. You need to be kind to your neighbors. You need to be kind to your uh, family members. You need to maintain ties. You need to look after the poor and the needy. And more importantly, this prophet, this messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa told us to believe in one God and not to ascribe partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when Abdullah bin Ja'far who said this to Najashi, the emperor of Ethiopia, the emperor of Ethiopia then asks Abdullah bin Ja'far that do you have any or can you recite to me some verses from the Holy Quran? So Abdullah bin Ja'far who then starts reciting Surah Maryam, Kaf Ha Ya Ain Swad. And this surah was actually revealed to regarding the group of Sahabas who migrated from Mecca to Ethiopia. The first part of the story talks about Sayyiduna Yahya alayhi salam, Zakariya alayhi salam, and then it goes on to talk about Isa alayhi salam and his miraculous birth and what we as Muslims believe in when it comes to Isa alayhi salam, that he's not the son of Allah, but he's a servant of Allah and he's a messenger of Allah. And when Abdullah bin Ja'far who started reciting the beautiful words of Surah Maryam, again, Najashi, the emperor of Ethiopia, and also his ministers who were around him, they could not contain themselves. They were also overwhelmed by the words of Allah that they also started crying and weeping to such an extent that their beard was wet and saturated with the tears from their eyes. And this is, I just mentioned two stories, but there are many, many stories. If you were to look at the books of Sirah, the Hadith, history will testify so many stories of people converting to Islam. Why? Because they heard the Holy Quran. And this is the true power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words to the extent that even the jinnats who are considered to be the most rebellious out of Allah's creation, they were overwhelmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words. They gave up their old ways and they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The very famous hadith which can be found in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan al-Tirmizi and Sunan al-Nasai, that the jinnats, they would actually venture upwards to listen to some of the news of heaven. But then all of a sudden, a meteorite started coming and would stop them from venturing upwards. So the jinnats, they got together and they asked themselves that, 
what is the thing you know what is that thing which is stopping us from venturing upwards and listening to the news of the heavens and the hereafter so they then agreed that we will scour around the world to see for that reason which is stopping us from going to the heavens and listening to the news of the hereafter so they scoured around the world when a group of jinnats came across Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam reciting Quran in the Fajr prayer in a place called Nakhla which is outside of Makkah Mukarramah so they go they then heard these beautiful words of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam reciting the holy Quran Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't know that there was jinnats behind him he just kept on reciting but they then slowly creeped closer to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so that they can hear the words and when they heard the words they also at that moment in time acknowledge and realize that this is the reason why we can't venture upwards this is the reason why we are have been stopped and prohibited from venturing upwards this is the reason why we can't do this this is the reason why we have to believe in allah and then the ayat goes on to say they then go back to the people ya qaumana ajibu da'i allah wa aminu bihi yaghfir lakum min dhunubikum wa yujirkum min adhabin alim that they go back to the people and they say that you have to believe in the holy quran you have to believe in these words and if you do yaghfir lakum dhunub min dhunubikum allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins wa yujirkum min adhabin alim and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save you from the humiliating punishment and then allah says wa man la yujib da'i allah fa laysa bi mu'jizin fil ardi wa laysa lahu min dunihi awliya and if you do not believe in these words of the holy quran then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not help you there will be no helpers for you there will be no assistance for you in the hereafter against allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's azab and humiliating punishment so these are just three stories which are mentioned regarding the effect the holy quran had on people on on people's hearts now moving along in the holy quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned or has described the holy quran in various different ways he's described it sometimes as al furqan he's described it as al huda and another word allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used another quality allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used to describe the holy quran is the word shifa a cure and that the holy quran when we analyze it it's a shifa and a cure for three things number one it's a shifa and cure for all our societal problems number two it's a shifa and cure for our physical ailments and number three it's a shifa and a cure for our spiritual maladies shifa ul lima fi sudur ai for our hearts and what i'm going to do i'm just going to very briefly touch on each of these three points now the first thing the holy quran is a shifa is a cure for all our societal problems now when we look around our community we find many many problems we find in one community people don't get along with each other we find in one community there's a breaking of ties we find in one community that one person is slandering or vilifying another person we find in one community that brothers they don't get along with each other sisters don't let, get along with each other in one community you'll find a father not speaking to his son a daughter not speaking to the mother and this is not something i'm um, from a book or from magazine i'm telling this is the truth this is hakikat we find these problems in our society and the reason why these problems are evident in our society is because we have left the quran we are not acting upon the holy quran because if we truly and properly acted upon the holy quran there would have been no problems in our society no petty issues of breaking of ties no petty issues of father not speaking to the son and daughter not speaking to the mother and in particular i want to explain a surah to you some verses from a particular surah surah hujurat now surah hujurat 
which is in the 26th para, is a surah which just totally, solely and exclusively touches on societal problems. And seriously, if everybody just acted upon surah ujurat properly, all the brothers and sisters will be living together in harmony and peace. There would be no problems at all. Now let's analyze some of the verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in this particular surah. Take for example number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu in ja'akum fasikum binaba'in fatabayyanu. Which means that if an information comes to you, a Quranic order, an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fatabayyanu. Check for its authenticity. These kind of rumors and gestures, slander, sometimes what happens, somebody will come to you and say, well, Imam Saab is like this, Mufti Saab is like this, Molana Saab is like this. Now, what normally would we do in that situation, instead of actually asking whether what this person or brother is telling is the truth, we then say, okay, Imam Saab is like this, Mufti Saab is like this, Molana Saab is like this, Sheikh is like this, and all of a sudden we then start developing hatred and some kind of like bad feeling for this sheikh when in reality this person just made up a slander and a rumor. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and really many of the problems which we have in our society is based on that. Many people don't like each other. It's not because he did something to you. It's because you heard someone say something about him and you without checking its authenticity, whether that information is true, without doing tasdeeq or verifying that information you then start believing in that individual and you then start having bad feelings for this person for this imam for this sheikh for this scholar however allah says for tabayyanu you should check for its authenticity and just very quickly the reason why this verse was revealed it was revealed regarding walid bin uqba now walid bin uqba Anhu, he converted to Islam and Rasulullah told Walid bin Uqba to go to Banu Mustalaq and collect zakat from them. Now let me explain the backdrop to this verse. Walid bin Uqba and Banu Mustalaq had some kind of issues but these issues did not come about after Islam, it came about before Islam. So they had some kind of enmity, some kind of issues, Walid bin Uqba and the Banu Mustalaq people. So what happened was Rasulullah he told Walid bin Uqba to go and collect zakat from them. When he went there, he saw the people of Banu Mustalaq, they all lined up. Now they lined up with the intention to give him zakat, but he thought they all lined up to basically take some revenge against him. So what did he do? Instead of taking zakat, he then went back to Rasulullah and he said to Rasulullah Oh, these people were ready to beat me up, these people were ready to fight me, they refused to give the zakat. Now when Rasulullah heard this, he was really, really angry. And it's mentioned in the hadith that he was willing to send the army to Banu Mustalaq to basically wage war against them because those who refused to give zakat, something which is first, something which is obligatory, Unfortunately, they go out of the fold of Islam. So Rasulullah was really, really angry. He was willing to send the army to go and wage war against the Banu Mustala when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse and he said, that when any information comes, you should always check the authenticity of this information. So this was just one verse of Surah Hujra where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about checking authenticity of information. If we move along in this particular surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed other verses regarding, regarding we should not ridicule each other. La yaskhar qawmun min qawmin asa ay yakunu khayram minhum. Similarly, there are verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that do not take the faults out of each other. Again, another reason why some people don't get along with each other is you may have an individual who always likes to take fault out of people. Or he's like this, he's like that. And many other things Allah mentions, such as no backbiting, no slandering, not to spy, not to have suspicion against another Muslim brother or against another Muslim brother. So what I'm trying to say is that Surah Hujurat is a beautiful surah. The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the wisdom regarding the verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed 
when we see if we were to act upon it properly and truly, all the societal problems would have been eradicated. And just under this particular uh, surah and chapter, I'll just mention what Imam Qurtubi rahimullah has said. Under the tafsir or the commentary of this particular surah, he's mentioned a hadith. So his commentary is on the hadith and he then links it with the tafsir and the commentary of this particular surah. Now the hadith which Imam Qurtubi rahimullah narrates is a very famous hadith of Sahih Muslim narrated by Sayyiduna Abu Huraira al-Anhu that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has said that in the hereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at your beauty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at your face but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look at your a'mals, your actions and your heart and what Imam Qurtubi rahimullah was trying to derive from this hadith is that sometimes we see people doing things which, and I'll be clear with the words I'm using, something which is khilafi awla, something which is slightly a bit funny, slightly disliked. Obviously, if, they, if you saw them doing something haram, that's different. But sometimes we see people, they're doing something slightly khilafi awla, something a bit odd. What Imam Qurtubi rahimullah has said that you should not jump the gun and come to your own conclusions. Just because someone has done something slightly disliked or something a bit odd, don't go and say, oh, well, he's like this, he's not a believer, he's like this, he's like that, he's a Farsic, he's a transgressor. And then at the same time, Imam Qurtubi rahimullah then goes on to say that if you see someone doing something religious, something pious, then also at the same time, don't be quick to jump the gun. Don't say, oh, mashallah, he's a, he's, a uh, he's a wali of Allah, he's a friend of Allah, because we do not know what intention is there in his heart for doing that. He's praying salah, but how do you know he's praying salah for Allah? How do you know he may be praying salah to please someone? He's giving some charity. How do you know he's doing it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He may be doing it for some other reasons. So you shouldn't be quick. Normally what happens, we are very quick to jump to conclusions. We see someone doing something slightly disliked. If it's haram, then it's different. But something disliked, we jump the gun. Oh, he's a Farsi, he's a transgressor. Naudhubillah, you have some who say, oh, he's a kafir. He's like out of the fold of Islam. So these things are totally wrong, totally incorrect. We should not jump to conclusions. Similarly, when we see someone doing something slightly disliked, but also at the same time, if someone was doing something good, again, we don't know what's in his heart. Because in another hadith, also Sahih Muslim, Rasulullah has said that three people will be thrown into the fire of hell. Firstly, and the three people are number one is a alim, a scholar. Number two, a mutasaddiq, someone who gives charity and sadqa. And number three, a warrior. These three people will be thrown into the fire of hell. Now, you guys probably think in Mufti Saab probably got his notes mixed up here. How on earth can a scholar enter the fire of hell? How on earth can someone who's probably given one million pounds to build a masjid, how can he enter the fire of hell? How can someone who's a warrior in the path of Allah enter the fire of hell? Now the reason why is because that scholar, he acquired knowledge, but not with the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That person who gave charity and sadaqah, not with the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That person who fought in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did not do with the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what I'm trying to say is that you sh we should be very, very, uh, we shouldn't uh, be very quick to jump to conclusion. We should always look at the situation. And this, again, as I said, if we were to act upon it, this particular surah, surah Hujurat, many of the societal ills or problems we're going through will inshallah be eradicated and erased. So that was the first part, the Holy Quran being a shifa and a cure for our societal ills and problems. Number two, the Holy Quran is also a shifa for our physical ailments, for our physical problems. And I'm not going to go into detail here because there's many, many ahadiths from Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. Whenever Rasulullah would fall ill, he would recite Kulazur bil Falaq, Kulazur bin Nas. He would then blow it onto his hand and then wipe it over his body. There's the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari where there was a, a leader of the tribe, he was stung by a, a scorpion. Then one of the Sahabas, Abu Sa'id al-Khudr al-Anhu, recited Surah Fatiha on that infected area and that person became better. 
So there's many, many examples like that. Unfortunately, again, what normally happens nowadays is that whenever we're ill, we look for the nearest imam, the nearest you know, amil or someone jadu orientated so that he could get this jadu and black magic out. However, the answer, the shifa, the cure lies in the Holy Quran. We recite the Holy Quran on that infected person, on that ill person, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take away the illness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take away the difficulty. The third point here is that the Holy Quran is also a shifa for our spiritual maladies, for our spiritual problems, any kind of problems which we have in our heart, the Holy Quran is a shifa and a cure for that. Now you may be thinking that what's so important about the heart? What's so important about the spiritual side? I'll just mention a few hadiths in front of you. The first hadith, which can be found in Sahih al-Bukhari, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has said that there is an organ in your body if you manage to rectify this organ, the entire body will be good. The entire body will be rectified. However, if you let this organ disintegrate, if you let this organ become bad, the entire body will become bad. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then goes on to say, Allah wa al qalb. Beware that this organ is the heart. In another hadith which can be found in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad rahimullah, that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he was with a group of sahabas and companions. And he said to the sahabas and companions that a person from the inhabitants of Jannah will appear before you. Basically someone from Jannah, someone who I am guaranteeing Jannah in this world will appear in front of you. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this on three consecutive days and on, those, and on the three occasions <coughs> Hazrat Saad bin Abi Waqqas who came in front of the Sahabas and the companions. Now one of the Sahabas who were with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he then approaches Saad bin Abi Waqqas and he doesn't tell him that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this that you will enter Jannah and Paradise but he says to him that, can I spend a night with you? Can I spend a night with you? I just want to basically stay with you. I just want to see what you do. So that Sahabi, that companion, he spends a night with Hazrat Saad bin Abi Waqqas bin Anhu. Now don't get me wrong, all the Sahaba's companions, they were doing the tahajjud all night or most of the night. They were doing the tasbih, they were doing the tahleel, they were doing the dhikr. And at the end of the night, the next morning, that Sahabi, that companion, he approaches Saad bin Waqqas and he says to him that Rasulullah mentioned that you're a person from Jannah, you're an inhabitant from Jannah. I've spent a night with you, but I haven't seen something, I can't pinpoint something where I could say that yes, this is taking you to Jannah and Paradise. So as Saad bin Waqqas replies by saying, well, I'm not hiding anything. This is who I am. This is what I do. I just pray my tahajjud. I do my tasbih. I do my tahleel. I do my dhikr. But then Saad bin Waqqas added something else. He said, however, there is one thing which I do do. And that is that before I go to sleep, I retire to bed having no grudges against anyone. With a pure heart. Qalb salib With a pure heart having no grudges against anyone. Having no rancor or envy against anyone. And then that Sahabi companion turned around and said, yes, this is the why you have entered Jannah. So something simple as having no grudges against anyone, having no rancor or envy against anyone. What did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa say and promise that this person, Ayyad uh, Saad bin Waqqas al-Anhu, he's from Jannah and he's from Paradise. And there's many, many examples of the importance of rectifying your heart and reforming your heart. Now, in our heart, unfortunately, because of the society probably we live in, because of other reasons, we have what we call resides, vile characteristics. And many of these vile characteristics bo uh, run from, say, things like anger to desires, to envy, to rancor, to hasa, to jealousy, to takabbur and to kibbutz. 
And out of all the resides and vile characteristics, there are two which we cannot eradicate, but the others we have to. The two which we cannot eradicate are number one, anger, and number two, desires. But what the Sharia and what the Quran and the Hadith of Rasulullah say is that we should control the desires, we should channel the desires, and we should channel the anger. And the reason why we can't totally eradicate anger and desires from our heart is because of another hadith also which can be found in Musnad Ahmad where Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if somebody comes and tells you that a mountain has moved from its place so somebody comes and tells you oh, Mount Everest is not there anymore it's gone somewhere else then Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says to saddiqu who believe him however if somebody comes and tells you that he has changed his fitra he has, like he doesn't have any anger anymore. He's got no desires in his heart anymore. Fala tusaddikuhu, do not believe him. Why? Because anger and desires, it can never ever be taken from you. But what the Sharia says, what the Quran says, is that you should use the anger in the good times. And not in petty issues or in good situation. An example of good situation, I've mentioned a hadith, that Rasulullah he will never ever get angry. But the only time when Rasulullah would get angry is if he would see someone breaking the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Somebody did anything against Rasulullah, he would forgive them. However, if somebody broke the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if somebody did something which was against the Quran, Rasulullah would then get angry. So this is what the Sharia says that you're gonna have anger, but you should channel it for the right reason, not to get angry on petty reasons or frustrated on petty issues and reasons but get angry when you see people breaking the commands of Allah and the same way with desires they're gonna have desires but channel it with those who are lawful for you are your wives and don't channel it in the wrong places so these two things will remain but then the other resilience and other bad characteristics and vile characteristics which we have in our heart as I already mentioned such as uh, like hatred, hasr, jealousy, takabbur, kibar, all these things we need to get rid from our hearts. And out of all the vile characteristics, the most dangerous is riya. Riya meaning show up. And that's why it's mentioned, as the scholars have mentioned, it's one, it's considered to be a category of shirk, shirk ya khafi. There's two types of shirk. One is called shirk ya jali. Uh, open shirk. An open shirk is then split up into two types. One is shirk fizzat, where you're ascribing partners with Allah. So like for example, you have a figure, a statue, and you start worshipping it. That is shirk fizzat. And then you've got another category, which sometimes, unfortunately, we do it as well. Shirk fizzifa, where we ascribing partners with one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes. So let's say, for example, we believe as Muslims that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has knowledge of the unseen. Now if somebody says, well, my Imam Sahib knows what's going to happen tomorrow, my Sheikh knows what's going to happen tomorrow, that is shirk fi sifa. If somebody say, for example, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the all-powerful, but if you now believe, no, my Peer or my Sheikh is the all-powerful, that is shirk fi sifa. You know, there's actually a, a story of a couple for around 12, 14 years, they didn't have any child, no children at all. They tried everything, no children. So then what happened? They went to Pakistan somewhere. They went to a grave. They did some dua or whatever they did. And then all of a sudden, the, the wife, she falls pregnant. And then she gives birth to a child. So that child, they actually believe that it's not from Allah. They believe this child is from the saint who is in the grave. So this is shirk fi sifa. Total ascribing partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very, very dangerous. And, and the reason I mention is the reason why it's very, very dangerous is inna Allah la yakfiru is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he never ever forgives shirk. So that is like shirk, the first category of shirk, shirk jali, the open shirk. And then you've got the second category of shirk, shirk khafi, which is like, for example, riya, show offing, where you are doing things, but you're not doing it with the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like as I was explaining before, like praying salah, giving sadaqah, charity, giving zakat, fasting. You're not doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're doing it for someone else. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is shirk ya khati, this is one of the hidden shirk which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to forgive. Now going back to what I'm trying to explain here is that what we should do is recite the Holy Quran and not just recite it during the month of Ramadan or when somebody passes away but recite the Holy Quran every single day all the time so that we can eradicate and take away the, the vile characteristics from our heart which then obviously takes me on to the next part of the talk which I want to mention and that is that when you have this subtle heart when your heart is tender in terms of reciting the Holy Quran acting upon the Holy Quran it then becomes easy for you to then act upon the Sunnah of Rasulullah now remember when I say the Sunnah of Rasulullah I don't mean just act upon the Sunnah of Rasulullah externally but not internally many people receive many brothers receive who's got a beard, who's wearing a jubba, who's wearing a hat they are there for the salah so externally you think that oh, they're acting upon the sunnah but internally they've got problems internally they make promises, they break the promises they lie, they slander, they vilify, they backbite that is not acting upon the sunnah when I say acting upon the sunnah acting upon the sunnah means internally so making sure that your heart is free from any of the vile characteristics and also externally in terms of the clothing, in terms of the beard, in terms of your actions. That is what is meant by the sunnah of Rasulullah And the best examples to follow when it comes to implementing the sunnah of our life is the sahabas, is the examples of the companions, in particular Sayyiduna ibn Umar al -Andu. Now Sayyiduna Ibn Umar I'll just mention a couple of stories. He was so staunch when he came to following the Sunnah. Word for word, action for action, he would act upon the Sunnah of Rasulullah There's a very famous hadith which can be found in Abu Dawood in Tirmizi where Rasulullah he would pray two rakats Fajr Sunnah then he would lie down for a bit, for a few minutes, and then he would uh, get up when Hazrat Bilal al Anhu would call him, and then he would pray the Fajr Jamaat. It's mentioned in the hadith, Rasulullah would do that. And all these scholars, all the jurists, they say that Rasulullah lying down after the two rakats Fajr Sunnah was done out of chance. Ittifaqan. Meaning that he didn't do it to show that this is a sunnah, but he did it out of chance. Now, Sayyiduna Ibn Umar al anhu he didn't want to look at that, whether Rasulullah did it out of chance or not. But from that moment onwards, every single day, Sayyiduna Ibn Umar al anhu after the two rakats Fajr Sunnah, he would lie down for a few seconds and then stand up and then pray the Fajr Jamaat. Why? Because he saw Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doing it. And there's another example of Sayyiduna Ibn Umar al Anhu regarding the black stone where it's mentioned in the Hadith of Tirmizi as well that after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away Sayyiduna Ibn Umar al Anhu, when people would gather around the black stone he would actually get into the middle, push people around so that he could go and kiss the black stone. Again, somebody would ask him that, why are you doing this? Because aren't you giving taklif, aren't you annoying anyone? So then Ibn Umar al -Anhu would say that the reason why I'm doing it, why is because I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa do it. So these are just two examples are given of Sayyidina Ibn Umar al -Anhu's staunchness when he came to following the Sunnah, word for word, action for action. And this is like the, you know, the final message I'll mention is that we should act upon the Holy Quran, we should get in the habit of reciting the Holy Quran that will then help us to take away our spiritual maladies, our spiritual problems and then when that happens we are then easily able to act upon the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I'll leave it there, the uh, Maghrib Salah is fast approaching. Uh, I'll finish by thanking uh, Munar Sahib and all the brothers who have uh, organized this particular event. Just one thing I want to mention is that uh, sometimes what happens is like the scholars or the imams they get all the accolades or like mashallah a great speech but actually the the people who really deserve the accolades are the the volunteer brothers 
Because if it wasn't for them doing all the chairs and the, you know, the equipment and so on, there wouldn't have been a conference, there wouldn't have been a talk. So I thank the brothers for organizing this particular talk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to act on what has been said. Wa akhiru da'awana alhamdulillah.